Can you see it? Hello, Skip. Good morning, Dr. Krishna. We're going to start in about a couple minutes. How's the weather? <laughs> it's cold. It's cold and gray. Uh, pity. <laughs> and wait, are you uh, in California? Yeah, one more day. Is it warm there? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. I'm looking Why at the Pacific Ocean. The fellows are asking where you are. <laughs> <laughs> We're in an Airbnb at Pacific Palisades, and I've been filming in <laughs> Los Angeles. One more day. Home tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks for watching. That, that's not a requirement of the fellowship. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's colloquium. As you can see, um, Professor Gates is with us, but um, virtually. He's unable to be with us in person today. Um, also unable to be with us is Damaris Hill, who is going to be introducing our speaker, Gavaza Maduleke. So I will be reading the introduction that she has sent me. Okay. So Gavaza Maduleke is Senior Lecturer of Political Science at the University of Cape Town. And Damaris, your colleague, says, over the past several weeks, it has been a pleasure to get to know her and her scholarship. In addition to the dynamic ways she explores the intersections of black studies, she is extending and developing the discipline of black political engagement into 21st century conceptions of intersectionality and expressions of solidarity in Pan-African contexts. She's also careful to remember the cultural values and teachings of her ancestors, whereby she's careful to consider and document the ethical and in some ways religious implications of her findings. She is a careful scholar who operates from a source of love and commitment to community. So please welcome Gavaza Madureke. Thank you so much, Krishna, for that introduction. And to Professor Hill, I am so, so uh, amazed at how much she was able to capture what, I've been do what I'm doing and what I've been doing for the past few years. So very, very happy to be here. Um, the, can we begin? Because I'm, OK. All right, so I also prepared something a little different um, for my introduction and because I felt that um, I'm here because I'm a scholar uh, from the University of Cape Town but I'm also here because I have been sent here by my ancestors and so I wanted to um, sort of pay homage to them and bring them along on this journey as I share this work with you. So this is how in my family and in my culture we would introduce someone, anyone in the family. So the, one, the video I'm going to show you or share with you is for a chief. So it's a bit special, but in just a normal uh, basis, this is how we would uh, introduce each other. Yeah. 
So that was just a little snippet of how we would do it. Um, because I'm not a chief, I wouldn't get the singing. <laughs> but um, yeah, that is important for uh, our family because it reflects uh, the work we do. Um, and the work that I'll be sharing with you is not just my work, but it's actually reflective of their work as well. So um, yeah, I'm going to begin. Um, let me just see. Okay. <laughs> Can you assist me quickly? Um, so the topic of my talk today is naming and shaming online. And um, I will be focusing on the hidden labor of um, speaking out against gendered violence in South Africa. So this is part of a larger book project that I've been working on for the past few years. And, um, and part of this work, I think, is important to for the South African context, and I think any context in general, that we always begin um, in our history, um, especially when we think about uh, violence in general. So in South Africa, I always want to frame this as the political economy of violence. And in the South African context, like any settler colony anywhere around the world, uh, this was a violent context, a conquest that was um, for many, uh, genocidal. Uh, for some, uh, there were levels of linguicide, and um, for many, epistemicide. And in, the, in our history, we talk about this uh, violence almost as if it's normal. Um, but there are so many different ways in which we all engage with this particular history um, in positive and negative ways, but it is what it is. And so for me, part of the work I'm trying to do is not necessarily judge those who participate in this, in this violence in their own way, but to also try and understand it and bring it into light. Um, so when we look at the violent con conquest in South Africa, it changes over time, um, and primarily because um, in the context that it was in, once they found uh, diamonds in Kimberley, um, the labor needs of imperialism were now were overtaking uh, the logic of extermination that was cu currently characterizing the violent conquest. So what we have in the South African context is uh, a lot of wars that are happening, almost around uh, 19 wars over a period of 226 years, I think, and I, be, I believe. But all the wars are taking place in this region. So the, they are called the frontier wars, primarily because they're taking place around the Cape Colony. And so this is where I am from. And so we are buffered in a way by this uh, group of people who are having to do a lot of work and a lot of labor um, in fighting against the, uh, the colonizers and the different colonial conquests. And it's important that I highlight that this is a very complex history. So for the sake of this particular uh, presentation, I'm just touching on certain points just to highlight um, what I'm trying to speak about and the problems that we then are having to deal with. So the frontier was also uh, resulted in men taking center stage because they were fighting the wars while women uh, had become extensions of the land. So they were primitive, conquerable, unrapeable, which meant that they were being raped and sometimes killed um, and exploitable. On the other side of it was the civilizing mission. The civilizing mission went along with uh, the war itself, um, but in many cases, the uh, civil, uh, the missionaries were almost seen as the intermediaries between the local communities and the colonial uh, or the colo colonizers. But what we find in most of the historical material is male voices, um, mainly reflective of the people we're writing. Um, as this quote says, early church writers were mainly men, and they naturally recorded, they naturally recorded their own voices and those of other men women received scant attention and no say except for a few testimonies. So there are quite a lot of, uh, there's quite a lot of historical accounts that 
I think historians, many historians here would know, you use this historical archive. Um, but most people or most researchers actually do not take into account that the voices of women it, uh, that are missing does not necessarily mean that those women were not there or they didn't have voices. Um, so we see written documents emerging by uh, mid-century, mid-19th century, and it's mainly African men. Um, they're writing uh, their own stories, they're writing themselves into history, and um, this begins to exclude African women as keepers of knowledge. And so many authors are now trying to retrieve and highlight uh, the, that missing historiography that is... Um, that should belong and highlights the that highlights women as knowledge keepers. Um, the second part of this is, and I think this tends to be missed, and I actually had no idea this had happened until I started doing this work myself. And this is an introduction of a particular form of labor. Everyone assumes, or we tend to assume, that this is how everyone was doing labor, or this is how the economy was organized around the world, but actually in different contexts, different uh, areas, people were organized very differently. And so once the mining uh, begins in South Africa, wage labor is introduced. And um, as this author, a British, uh, he's the British novelist, says, who can doubt but that work is the great civilizer of the world? Work and the growing desire for those good things which work will only bring. Um, reading this was, is sometimes very difficult for me because it, I see it reflected in the way in which me and many other young South Africans think about uh, work, that we believe that, um, that this is something that is good, that that was brought for us, well, that, not necessarily that was brought to us, but that this is a part of who we are. Um, so reading this in a way allows me to see that this was imposed and these are ideas that we need to sort of uh, interrogate and see why uh, sometimes we don't like going to work and that we are so uh, against work at times. Um, but what this resulted in is the ignoring of all other forms of labor that were already in place. And these forms of labor still exist today and they're still part of and parcel of uh, the work that we do culturally. And so it's not part of the wage labor but it is still there. And so this, my work tries to sort of bring this back. The other element that I want to highlight here is that because of the civilizing missions, one, uh, a couple of things happen, and one of these, uh, the two divisions that we see here. Um, so we find that a lot of African men specifically um, started going to school and some decided not to be a part of that. And so this is where respectability politics emerged. Um, and I think uh, a lot of uh, that discourse plays out here in the US as well. Uh, and we also see men versus women. Um, this gender difference or this gender relations are cemented almost um, becoming part of our cultural practice that men become providers um, and, you know, men, African men are the head of the family. It's only in the last few years that I realized that this is actually not naturally what we used to do. Um, and women only show up in discourse as either victims of traditional culture, meaning that our traditions are uh, in oppressing women, and or uh, as children to those who want to empower them to become better women. Um, you know, for uh, their African husbands who are providers so they can keep a nice home. And I think these elements are very important because they become part of our understanding of who, who we are as South Africans, whether you are from the Eastern Cape or Limpopo. Um, if you're a black person, these are some of these ideas that you think are important. Going to school is something that our parents encourage. Um, and for many years, people are ashamed of who they were, how they dressed, who their, what their cultural practices were. And it's only in the last few years that we are seeing this much more being uh, showcased and circulated. So people would do it in their homes because those are uh, practices that you're used to, um, but they would also uh, hide their cultural practices a lot. Um, so it's only in the, yeah, in the last few years that we're seeing a shift, and, um, and this is also happening because of scholarship. 
So on the other side of that, so we are colonized, but there is resistance to colonialism. And the nationalist struggles that happened in the 1900s under the ANC were led by primarily African elites, so those who went to school. So they didn't actually really have a lot of money, uh, but um, many of them had been civilized. And so it meant that they were better than their, um, their peers or the black masses that were uh, uh, uncivilized living in rural areas. And as Eels uh, points out, this is a quote taken, he didn't, he's not specifically quoting uh, Jabavu, but he is highlighting or analyzing uh, Jabavu's words. And Jabavu was an African uh, leader at the time. He, um, I think he founded the All Africa Confederation and, um, and this, He's a, a very important leader, even in our uh, discourse uh, as young uh, Africans, we all are aware of his work. And this is what he had to say, the root cause of the low status accorded African women by men was customary marriage practices. It reduced women to the level of chattels, a commodity that, it, that is purchased by the highest bidder and obliged them to populate the home with as many children as possible as a return for the cattle. Such matrimony was neither holy nor monogamous. The way out of this primitive state would begin when African women were liberated from unreasonably heavy agricultural work. If we mean to rise in this world and to command the respect of other nations, we must begin by raising up our women. And I mean, this is the discourse that uh, emerged post-1994 as well, um, that people's traditions were the practices that were um, negative, that needed to be changed, um, that it was African culture that was problematic. And I think what this shows is how the imposition of colonialism, but the lingering effects of it, that we were, it, were, it was not just a, a violent conquest that took over and killed people, but actually that all these ideas became something that we then internalized as ours. And I think many people tend to say, when I bring this up, tend to say that I'm uh, romanticizing pre-colonial Africa. I'm not talking about pre-colonial Africa, I'm talking about stories that you can tell uh, or ideas that are traveling and they come at a part in, in a particular form and then we obviously take them up and reuse them, but in reusing them, we can't own them fully. And I think we need to make a distinction between African culture and African European culture, because this is what it is. Um, and so some of these circulating narratives um, have been debunked in the last few years, uh, the, especially the practice of bride, uh, bridal price. Um, this is not, they, there are many scholars who are arguing that the notion of bride price or lobola as bride price, and meaning that women uh, should be bought or are being bought um, by men is actually untrue, that the notion of marriage in, in African practices uh, take up so many more other uh, elements and bride price is just one of many. And there are other explanations as to why there's, they bring cows to the family. And so understanding the larger story instead of just picking on the one element that fit into capitalistic structures is actually uh, something that we need to take into account and think about how that permeated throughout other ideas that we are sort of taking up and floating with at the moment. So the next point I want to highlight is how resistance to colonialism also started to bring up the notion of policing of women's bodies. And um, we see this obviously with the influx uh, in the 1920s of rural African women going into the cities to look for work there was an economic, economic decline. And so many women, my great great grandmother was one of these women that went to the city because her husband had died and she needed to make a living. And um, yeah, she's also sold alcohol. So when I read this story, it was actually quite funny to me uh, because she was able to buy a home <laughs> because of this uh, alcohol uh, sales that she would do. Um, but there was, Many of these women were actually uh, African women, rural African women going into the cities. They were seen as um, carrying diseases. Um, they were also seen as immoral, not only by the 
colonizers at the time, but also by middle class or elite African women and men. And so you see this division where the people who went to school versus the ones who didn't, this division is showing up through this as well. And so it becomes, this is how our culture works. This is what is holding us back from being seen as human and being equal. And it actually stops us uh, from assimilating and being accepted into the white uh, society. And then later on, we see the 1970s, these representations of African women in a popular black magazine start to add a, a violent element. And um, so you still have the supportive mothers, those who keep the home, look after the home, and the, I the ideal picture of what a mother should be or an African woman should be versus the very sexually transgressive women. And in the text, they start to, uh, yeah, to highlight that those, to keep them, to show them that their behavior is bad, we need to rape them. And so this becomes part of, yeah, if you're trans sex sexually transgressive, we need to show you how uh, that is bad for our community as a whole. And so there's a lot of literature. I mean, I think Ken Temba is one of the most popular ones who writes a book, and it's very well known, well circulated, but he is punishing his wife for cheating on him in that uh, story. And it becomes something, when you think about it now, you realize just the, the, the kind of narratives that are, or, and, and the ideas that are circulating within that text itself, showing how he's policing his wife's behavior, and it's acceptable for him to cheat, but not necessarily her. So now I'm bringing you to the present moment. Um, so our post-1994 uh, moment is one of hope in South Africa, but just before that period, there was a lot of violence. Um, so violence that you know, was internalized, so it was within the community. So much of it, obviously in the 70s, you see this raping element uh, or come in and emerge, but in the 80s, this becomes worse. And also within the uh, underground movement, there's also a lot around uh, violence towards women, uh, especially those who were probably one or two in the camps. Men saw them as, well, you're here to service us and not necessarily uh, fight for freedom or fighting for freedom for you as a woman also looks like this servicing us. And so, um, yeah, then we come out of post 94, we come into post 94, a very violent society with women as the primary target. Um, yeah, and it has led to many scholars really uh, arguing that South Africa is in this contradictory situation where women have all the rights in the world and yet we do not feel safe. Um, and women do use those rights, meaning that they will report whatever happens to them, especially if it's rape, um, they will um, uh, what organize and, and protest using this, those same uh, uh, sections in the constitution, but it still hasn't changed anything. It hasn't changed as much as we would wish it would change. And um, Biko, one of the leaders of the Black Consciousness Movement, actually predicted this reality um, when he argued that because the ANC and those before them were not necessarily rejecting the institutions, that uh, came along with colonialism, but actually were just focused on the uh, government. So let's get rid of the colonizers, let's get rid of the government, uh, the apartheid government, but not necessarily let's actually look at the structure in itself and all that it carries and what it has done to the minds of the oppressed and then change that. They didn't, th this is not the work that they did. And so he actually highlighted this and you can actually see that for many young South Africans today, we actually are much more vocal, but we assume that our grandmothers and our mothers were not as vocal as us, but they were. They were just uh, excluded from the narratives. And so much of what happens with the rise of act, uh, digital activism in South Africa, especially against gendered violence, it happens around the same time that this is happening in the US and around the world. Um, but it also has a history of its own in terms of, in 2006, there was a big case where a young, uh, young woman, they named her Kwezi on, uh, in the media, but her name was Fezekile Kuzwayo, 
And uh, she accused the then vice president of the ANC, Jacob Zuma, of rape. And she went through a really difficult uh, court case. He was acquitted in the end. And she received a lot of uh, threats, violent attacks, to the point where they even burned her house and she had to go into exile. So this is a very scary reality for us when uh, black people had to be in exile during apartheid and then you are now having someone go into exile uh, post-apartheid. And so um, there were a lot of women, especially at Rhodes University, who uh, started organizing and doing protests. Uh, they would have these silent protests, as you can see here, every year at the same time from around 2007. And uh, they would um, march throughout the city um, discussing, and not discussing because they would tape themselves, but they would have these placards highlighting uh, what it is they were fighting for. So this is the history in which young activists or these young activists are sort of emerging from. And then what is also happening around the world with Black Lives Matter or even other uh, hashtags like uh, solidarities for white women. Young digital activists in South Africa are very active. Um, you're not going to meet many of them on, in this discussion, but they're very active. They are mainly at university, but the discourse uh, cuts across age. Um, and it also cuts across class, divides if there, if there are any online, um, and also race. Uh, it's, and also, I think, sexuality as well, because they're behind the, the screen. So you are not sure who you're actually uh, reading, whose work you're reading. But yeah, they're all there. And, um, and they've been paying attention to, they had paid attention to the fact that with fees must fall, them organizing online, them doing a lot of work online, and speaking out online, uh, there was a lot of impact. So this is sort of where this kind of speaking out emerges from. Um, but I also wanted to highlight that I try and look at this context and read this context from two perspectives using uh, Oyewemi Oyeronke's work, uh, where she talks about world viewing, which is more coming out of Europe and world sensing, which is more of an African epistemology. Uh, the South African context itself is very diverse in its movement. So people, I would say we have both the European or Eurocentric thinking uh, guiding us, but we also have uh, African uh, thinking guiding us and people move between these worlds very seamlessly, especially for those who are Bantu, um, because many speak English, but they also speak their mother tongues. Um, so from the seeing perspective or the seeing way, I'm going to uh, use um, scholars such as um, Jared Nakamura and Mendes and her colleagues, uh, who all write around this notion of immaterial labor, women's work, um, and feminist activism and what it actually looks like now. And then from a sensing perspective, I'm focusing on African scholars. And it's important for me to point out that African scholarship that I'm working with is new and also old. Uh, there's a lot of work written um, and done during the 1970s by African scholars from different parts of the world, uh, different parts of Africa, so East Africa, uh, West Africa, and even Central Africa. And so South Africa being late to the game, we are borrowing and uh, uh, using their work. So this means that we actually have a better foundation um, uh, we, and we can do a lot more. Um, but there's a lot of scholarship emerging out of South Africa now as well. So as you can see, Maseko, Tisane, uh, and Ramose, they, uh, these are some of the scholarship uh, scholars that I've been working with. And I also wanted to sense my way using uh, South African concepts or South African words uh, that are all related to the concept of labor. And the first one is litsima, which is a Sutu word called um, Plural form is matima, and it's basically working together based on the principle of mutual concern, care, and sharing. And then we also have the word umsebenzi on tiro, which is the word for work. Uh, this is in Zulu and Shitsonga, my language, and it can mean employment, so being in wage labor. It can mean just everyday work. It can also mean performing a duty or a task or raising someone, and it can also mean a ritual, a ceremony, or event. So we have a lot of times so or many contexts where our parents uh, will say, you have worked. 
So it doesn't mean you've worked well, but you have worked. And that shows up in, if you do something good for your family, they'll say you have worked. And so that is a, a form of working that doesn't actually have a wage element to it, but it's very important work for us. And so I'm trying to sense my way reading uh, the data that I have. And I should be clear that much of the data that I have, although speaks to so many people, I'm sensing it through a particular framework, uh, which is Bantu, uh, or the language of the Bantu, uh, because I'm Bantu. And um, in South Africa, we have Khoisan, uh, which has their own different, uh, own, I would say, um, yeah, structures in the language, and I don't speak it. Um, and I mean, you can even see it, uh, much of what Bantu, uh, languages do is very much rely on lived experience. So for instance, today is the 1st of November, which is the month of November, beginning of the month of November. And in my language, it is hukuri, which means it is the time of the chicken laying eggs and hatching. And then in Kosa, because they live in a part of the country that has nice things, it is uh, a different name and it's the time of the blossoms. And so you can see that although the idea is about connecting to things around us and nature, it is still very specific to the context and that is matters here. And I bring this up very uh, clearly in my own work. So I wanted to begin with the story of um, Yolanda Dianti, who is a student or who was a student at the university or Rhodes University. And um, I want to highlight or I want to begin with her because she sort of fits into this individual frame of just doing work by herself, doing labor, doing labor on her own. So uh, Yolanda um, participated in the Fees Must Fall, Roads Must Fall movement, and then uh, joined the RU reference list movement uh, or protest and naked protest in April 2016. This protest happened uh, because a list of uh, past and present students who had been accused of rape was circulated on Facebook. And, uh, and then they rounded up uh, the students who were on the list. And from the perspective of the uh, activists, they were um, trying to get the university to hold them to account. But according to the university, uh, this was a criminal offense. And they, um, yeah, so they expelled Yolande and four other students. Um, two. Yolandi and uh, Dominic Wolf were expelled for life uh, from university, so they wouldn't be able to ever uh, attend university in South Africa. And so Yolandi, this is the story of her laboring in a way. It begins at this point um, and it continues until 2022 when she wins the case to overturn the, the situation. And so, but I, I'm wanting to highlight this because and tell the story, uh, Yolanda's story, because when you look at the kind of labor that she had to do, she was on TV, uh, she was on Instagram Live, she was posting, um, but during this whole time, she didn't have any money. Uh, she had to ask for donations. Um, she was struggling to find work. And so, because in South Africa, again, that divide between those who went to school and those who didn't actually affects the kind of work that you can find. Um, and so her case is very uh, interesting because it happens within this kind of, she, she, um, she participated in a protest with close to maybe two, 300 students. And then she was one of the five picked to punish. And so that also tells you the kind of system that we work with, but in punishing her alone, picking her and punishing her, uh, like, for instance, this student here saying, standing in the streets where I witnessed and became part of this historical manifestation. She was part of this protest with Yolanda. Uh, but yet her story becomes something that uh, is specific and it's special because, because we need, she needed to be isolated um, or they needed to isolate the, the five students to punish them. Um, but then because they did this, um, it also opened up other discussions with Rhodes University and how they've been punishing students for participating in protests. Um, yeah, so I wanted to highlight this and highlight the kind of labor and show that this labor is hidden, uh, as the digital feminists uh, say, that it is unpaid work, but it is work that we do need to consider um, in terms of 
the labor and what it can do to, uh, uh, in, in a person's life. Uh, this was important work for her because she was able to win the case. Um, but what happens when you don't win the case? When, you know, the outcome that you wanted doesn't happen. And she was supported by uh, uh, a, uh, an organization that's, uh, that is, um, what is it, free? And so she didn't have to pay for lawyers. But if you have to pay, it really isn't uh, possible to do this kind of work. So Yolanda, in many ways, is a special case, but is a case that uh, has sort of emerged in South Africa. And it's within this uh, capitalist frame, it shows how the kind of silencing that plays out uh, plays out by taking a group of people and then picking a couple to punish, and so then they must labor on their own. Um, but part of the other work that happens online is that they speak about sexual violence, um, and this is a core idea of what the kind of labor that they are engaging in. So some report their rape on social media platforms. Uh, like this case, uh, the student was a UCT student, uh, she was uh, part of the Fees Must Fall, Roads Must Fall movement, and uh, she was sexually assaulted um, in Azania House, which was a, a building that the students had occupied. And so she, instead of reporting at the university, whether it was campus police or going to the police, she decided to go on uh, Facebook to report her case. And so this, in many ways, is uh, her way of saying that the system's in place don't actually support me. They're not gonna hear me, they're not gonna assist me, but a larger group will put pressure. And that is uh, something that works in the South African context. Uh, the second case is not by the student who was raped, but by a friend or uh, as someone who knows her or lives in the same campus, and this happens at Wits University. And um, the student had reported, but she was told that it's during its exams, and therefore we can't really uh, do anything to the, um, what is it, the perpetrator. So the student had to be on campus with her perpetrator uh, and really struggled through that. So the student actually ended up leaving. But, bef but after she left, the st once the st student posted the story, there's actually so much that the, the students were able to do uh, by protesting offline, getting the university to actually come up with uh, like an independent committee to interrogate what happened, why didn't they do the work that they did, and why did they treat the student the way that they did. And so this kind of labor w that is sort of outside of how we think about it, because when you think, why would someone report online? They'll, you'll have attacks. People will you know, threaten you and all of that. But when, you, when the students think about the kind of context and the system that they're in, this is easier and this is better and it's more effective. And so that tells you also a lot about the context of South Africa in terms of the institutions we have and how they view women and how they view uh, rape. The uh, third point is around how they use the space to share stories of institutional silencing. Um, this happened quite a lot. Uh, with Rhodes War RU reference list, but as you can see, the different cases, students that are, or the activists that are online are almost, um, they use the space to educate each other, to inform each other, and to also highlight uh, certain ways of thinking. Um, and so you can see one saying, Mowbray police further violated her by claiming she's crazy for demanding the assistance of a woman police officer. This sort of, it's like, almost like exposing uh, the system. So they are able to share much more than what would happen offline. Offline would be like the police, uh, change the police or whatever. But here they're actually able to tell you the story of what the police actually did to the, uh, to the, to the person who went to report. Um, they also highlight the fact that, you know, we cannot be silent while a fellow black woman is terrorized by the racist institution named after Cecil Rhodes. And this came up quite a bit because the, obviously the, the university is called Rhodes University. And um, a few years before, the students had um, been protesting to get rid of his statue and also change the name of the university. And so these are some of the elements. They make connections and are not just thinking about rape per se, and they're not thinking about it as just a, a male to female dynamic that somehow is always, it's like a circulating narrative that we 
that is very, I think, uh, prevalent in ways of seeing, but in the ways of sensing, students really go beyond this and they highlight other elements that I think are, are important. And then the last one is cautioning us about circulating the picture of Tavis as a silencing mechanism and placed directly into patriarchy. So I just wanted to highlight some of these uh, really interesting stories about institutional silencing, but also speaking back to our history and how they are more vocal, um, they are speaking out more, but, and they are not being paid. But this is important that they speak out because they are thinking about uh, those um, mothers and grandmothers who couldn't speak out, who couldn't highlight how they were uh, silenced by the different institutions. And then the last point is sharing survivor stories. So for instance, this is a UCT, that's, this is my university. Uh, students have a website where students could go and post um, all the experiences of violence, um, different forms of violence. Sometimes it's students asking, is, was this rape? You know, can I report this? It was, and this is a space where they can get a lot of support. Um, but you can also get a case like the one above where someone is talking about, I reported my case and applied for extended leave for absence and had to deregister because I couldn't cope. They said they can only investigate once I re-registered as a student in 2018. I'm not going back, forget it. And I mean, this is one, as just one student, but there are many cases like this where students feel that the university systems that are in place, the institutions are just not there as uh, very supportive. And so students go into this, um, go online to report, to highlight to other students and other activists out there what has happened to them, but to also warn them so that they know not to uh, come to roads, for instance, because the systems are just not in place, or if this happens to you, report in a different way. So this labor, the minute we keep it within this um, unpaid and therefore it should be paid, we miss some of these elements around what actually they're trying to do. What are they, they're speaking to each other, they're speaking, and it's not just uh, a story about my story, but what would, you know, letting someone else know. Uh, that could, it could happen to them. And this is what is uh, highlighted here by this other student who says it's been two years since the hashtag are you reference list, but it hurts my heart knowing that I was raped a year later, that the university never listened, but at least it started a conversation. And so these are some of the stories that students or activists are sharing um, when these kinds of hashtags are circulating. And then the last point around speaking is that they have to speak to mainstream media. And the reason why this is so important is because mainstream media in South Africa forms part of the global capitalist structure that sort of silences other voices while amplifying others. And so bodies, black women's bodies are always hyper visible in when, it's, when they've been violated. So they will describe them in very negative ways. And so these students are not only speaking out to you know, challenge the university like uh, Zola is doing, or um, uh, Yolanda is doing here where she says, Mama, I've been expelled, but it is to also control the, their own narrative, to contribute to that narrative. It's uncomfortable, it's un not uncomfortable, but it's difficult for the university to be able to control, or like someone powerful to be able to control the media when students are, or the activists are busy highlighting uh, their own narratives. And so they do this work not just uh, to get paid, but because they want to make sure that their stories are not erased, not in the way that their grandmother's stories were erased in the past. So the last case that I wanted to highlight is the importance of uh, what digital feminists are talking about when they talk about paying attention to this as labor. Uh, and I think it's important for us to extend or expand this concept of labor and unpaid labor to include what happens when someone speaks out. So for instance, with Kwezi, uh, this was very costly for her, but she, needed, she felt that she needed to speak out. Uh, Kwezi made sure that she wrote a poem to keep her story alive and going. Um, she made sure when the um, media was writing uh, all these negative um, articles about her um, to, be, to, to bring in her own voice. And so she, was, she wrote this article with the help of 
uh, people who were part of her one in nine campaign and they were able to ask her questions and she was in a safe space and was able to speak. But this also speaks to uh, Kwezi's networks, obviously. And, um, and I think the kind of labor, this kind of labor, um, she speaks in this, in, in this article, she speaks about how she needed to make sure that she had all her evidence and that she got a rape kit, even though she felt unsafe um, with the nurses that were doing the work that she you know, gave her st statement, but still felt unsafe and she felt like she wasn't being heard. Um, yeah, this is labor and I think we do need to, it's hidden labor and we need to take, uh, take this into account because it can be very costly. Kwezi, for instance, was um, homeless in a way, went into exile, spent time in the Netherlands, spent time in Tanzania, but decided after a while that she's no longer scared and was gonna come home and she came back to South Africa. Sadly, she passed away in 2016, but um, she did a lot of work and Kwezi's story uh, is something that keeps on coming up when students or, and activists talk about their rape. So I would argue one of the things that we need to start paying attention to, and this is around sensing, is that laboring is a form of duty. And within the African context, uh, when we look at Litsema, for instance, um, and even the idea of umsebenzi, which is, you know, it's uh, looking at rituals, uh, looking at the task, looking at duty. It makes it clear that these young activists are not just laboring online uh, just for themselves. They're not just speaking their stories. They're speaking so that there are no blank pages in history, right? They're speaking about to make sure that they are not erased like their grandmothers were, um, that these are stories, these hashtags all form part of one story. And if someone doesn't do it, then you know, they, there's a likelihood that their story will not make it in the history books. And that for them is something that they are willing to pay the price. Um, these young activists here um, protested, I think in 2018 maybe, I can't remember the year, uh, but they, while well, the president was giving a speech, uh, they stood up and as you can see, they have a hashtag there, they have Kwezi's name, and it actually trended as hashtag remember Kwezi. And the whole point of this, uh, and they were able to speak, they wrote articles responding to, you know, what happened, why, Yes, it was Zuma, yeah. yeah. They spoke about why they uh, felt the need to speak and they didn't want the government obviously to control the narrative. And so many young people online who didn't know about Kwezi because the story had you know, been shifted and changed in the media were able to ask who is Kwezi, right? And so this kind of work that they're doing they don't see it as labor that needs to be paid because just that question, who is Kwezi, is enough of a payment because they are able to ensure that we remember Kwezi and that we are all challenged in that moment to remember why Kwezi happened and what we did as a country by voting someone like uh, Jacob Zuma into the presidency and what we told, what, what the message was to Kwezi in a way. So, one of the last points is, that I want to make is around the question to solidarity, um, laboring as doing. Um, so this student writes uh, a letter to another rape survivor uh, who had been, uh, who had, whose story had circulated and there was a hashtag. Um, and she speaks about how they did not shut down the campus when it happened, uh, that we didn't do enough and we didn't do enough because in the South African context, there is that element that our hashtags are always at, uh, accompanied by offline protests. They don't happen just alone. We don't just speak online and write and we, most of the hashtags, not all of them, there's always a level of, um, uh, what is it, uh, offline protesting. And one of the arguments that I'm trying to make here and highlight is the fact that, yes, for many, uh, laboring is doing because in the South African language of labor, umsebenzi, it is work. You need to physically do something. And so I know that if a student, and I can hear it with, if I told this to my mom as well, if I, if I said we went and protested and we shut down the campus, my mom would say, which means you've worked. And so I think this 
is something that if you are just looking at what they're doing, it just looks like, yes, they're physically there doing this kind of work, protesting. However, for them, they understand their parents, whether good or bad, they would still see this. And family, other family members as well would still see not just the typing. If they hear you just typed and you know wrote something, it's okay. But if you showed up and you did something, that is doing. And for them and for our culture, this is work. This is a form of work because you showed up and you showed support. And so the question to solidarity here is, that's being asked is, is solidarity just about typing something online or is it doing? And in the South African context, it's both. And, um, and this is what I'm arguing because of the way in which we understand labor. So the next point that I want to highlight in response to my own question is around black tax. And I bring this idea up because this laboring and doing that in a form of duty in the South African context because of the system that we're currently in that doesn't see that kind of labor. We are starting to have words like black tax and what that is is that it is cost additional to government tax whatever deductions are mandatory not because of physical policy but because of cultural and family relations. This is, a, this is something that within our cultural systems, very normal, something that we do, we all do. As you can see, she's carrying all of those. But however, this does not show that she was once on the other side and someone carried her. And this is important, that there is a level within this kind of system that is asking you to only focus on your own wealth, your own comfort and your own success, that it doesn't help you to look back. And so what I want to highlight and what I want to show through the work is that there are those who look back and we need to remind ourselves as South Africans, as Bantus, that we do a lot of work looking back without realizing that we are, that we do a lot of work that is Bantu, that has a Bantu ethos or a Ubuntu ethos, um, that because it's natural to us, that that's how it's done, that we don't recognize that it actually is something that is not pre-colonial, that it is part of us, it's part of the modern world. And so I think it is important that we highlight this as something that's important to us, the way they are highlighting it here, so that the economic system that refuses to see it can maybe adjust to it. And, and this is the same for you know, all these other forms of labor, that we don't have to labor, not, not all labor has to be waged, but labor needs to be recognized and seen. So to conclude, um, my main arguments here have been that we need, that the great, um, this research in a way allows us, and this chapter in particular, allows us to see that we do need to ask, uh, unmask the material labor that's online um, and, us, and, and also expand it to look at offline labor, like the labor that uh, Kwesi participates in. Um, the labor of speaking out against gendered violence forms part of the political economy for the oppressed. It is labor that we've been doing since colonial conquest in a way. It's just that it's labor that is not within the political economy that makes uh, money for us, but it is makes money for uh, those that are oppressing others. Uh, let's say my as relational work is not just performing a duty to activists, but to others from the past and the future. And this highlights the Ubuntu ethos of connection, which is that we are always connecting to the living dead and we're always thinking about the yet to be born because those form part of who we are as humans. And so we do not do work on our own, but we do work with others because it might happen to us as well. Uh, the doing that um, unpins, underpins uh, Umsebe in own Tiro offers us a way to understand why digital activism seems to always be accompanied by doing, by actions. And so for me here, my work is not to dispute the ways of seeing that come out of the uh, European frameworks, but to say that we also need to bring in a ways of sensing uh, because recentering African epistemologies shows us that despite the attempted erasure, African values and ethos are still continuing. And um, this is important for Africans to remember. Thank you.
I just wanted to end with um, a video. And because we began with an introduction, I thought it um, important to end with a video uh, that in a way uh, allows me to pay homage to those who fought uh, the wars in the frontiers and in fighting that war, they allowed us to be here today, especially, specifically me. So I just wanted to play this quickly. And, oh, what did I do? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Wow, that's a powerful way to end, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but fabulous presentation. Um, my question is um, about your theoretical models at the very beginning. Uh, have you thought about the uh, concept of work embedded in the politics of respectability here in the United States at the turn of the century, specifically the work of Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, our colleague in the program in the history department? Um, no, I've never heard of this, so this would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, in Evelyn's book called Righteous Discontent, and um, it is um, an ideology, a, a, a concept reflecting class difference mm -hmm. and privilege within the race and among women. And uh, so it was attendant upon the uh, formation of the uh, National Association of Colored Women and their motto, Lifting As We Climb, and their relationship as privileged women mm -hmm. to women who actually worked or did a physical kind of work. Mm -hmm. And it had a lot to do with sexual mores, mm -hmm. um, the public discourse about sexuality, obviously um, about rape mm -hmm. um, at, at the other end of what their ideology was signifying. It might be something you would consider because yeah. I love your theoretical models, but I think it would be nice to have one from uh, black women yes. on this side of the Atlantic too. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much. Um, and also, as, especially because the activists really uh, draw on works from uh, black feminists in the US. So I think that would be fitting. OK, great. Fabulous Thank job. Thank you. Krishna, I can only see myself twice. <laughs> That's not <enough> good. <laughs> so if they could adjust the camera so I could see her, that would be great. Thank you for that presentation. It was really wonderful. I especially appreciated your reminders about all of the um, offline protesting that's happening, because I think there's certainly a kind of generational dismissal that can mm -hmm. happen around those hashtags, or people think that's all that's happening. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciated that. Um, I just had a quick comment and a quick question. The comment is, I, I thought, this idea of like extending the concept of labor is mm -hmm. just working really well. And I was, I was thinking that it could be really interesting if you could link that up to just like work in the digital, digital humanities and scholars who are working in, on these digital spaces to talk about how bizarre and how amorphous labor is. Like just, it, these digital spaces 
are morphing labor in mm -hmm. very particular ways, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, it's like there's the kind of mystification of labor that's happening um, in terms of who's coding, who's producing these, these interfaces, mm -hmm. but then there's also the mystification and erasure of our own labor, right? Like this idea that like every time we like something, that's actually free labor, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I think just there could be some really great connections to be made in terms of just the reorganization of labor that's happening through the digital sphere. I think one of the scholars that I work with, Jared, uh, does this uh, very well as well. Uh, she speaks around this notion that just clicking in itself is the consumption of labor. Uh, cons consumption of information online, of that cultural knowledge is a labor uh, of some kind. And what do we do with that? How do we see it? And thinking about it from women's work is a good way for us because there's all this women's work and obviously it stays unpaid, uh, but it is important work that then can help us understand. So it's almost like taking a feminist lens to look at what's happening digitally. Yeah. Would you also, could you talk at all about the uptake of conversations around transformative justice? Mm -hmm. Is that something that's happening in a South African context? Thinking um, about harm reduction, you know, thinking about dealing with conflict and different forms of violence, including sexual violence apart from the state and the police? Is, is that part of this conversation? Mm, I'm trying to think. I know that in one of my chapters, I highlight that there's a difference in terms of, um, and which, you know, is not as popular. Um, there's a focus we tend to think of uh, violence in South Africa as something that happens um, out there. Someone, you know, some stranger, you know, maybe could be someone you know, but it's a stranger. There's, that's the narrative that circulates in media. But there was a hashtag that was started by a group of students, a group of activists, and they were talking about intimate partner violence. And uh, their hashtag actually didn't go viral until uh, a young woman was killed by her boyfriend. And so it's almost like, there are certain discourses that probably uh, circulate, but they don't have the uptake in the same way that uh, certain voices or certain narratives that circulate would. Yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the data and I haven't seen anything that sort of speaks uh, about this. I think almost everyone's like, we're still dealing with this uh, current issue. We're just trying to target silencing, which is the main frame currently is there's a lot of silencing that happens once we report. Everyone says speak up, but when we speak up, there's a lot of silencing. And this is at the core of what much of the discourse is around. So it's not that people don't speak out in South Africa. It's what happens when they speak up. Yeah. Thank you so very much for this fascinating talk. Um, I learned a lot. And I have a few questions. I'm just trying to limit it to two. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I know that your focus is on, on the digital mm -hmm. uh, organization. And my first question sort of goes back uh, before the digital age. But was there a connection between sort of feminist uh, awakening and movements against gender violence in South Africa that was in any way connected or affected by sort of the worldwide awakening of feminist consciousness in Europe and the United States, you mm -hmm. know, like in the 60s when a lot of new women's organization, black and white women's organization in Europe and the United States were founded, mm -hmm. did that somehow also um, affect things in South Africa? Mm -hmm. And then also in the digital age, did the whole Me Too debate, to what extent did that affect speaking out against uh, violence and rape um, in South, South Africa? Africa. Mm. And my last question is, is simply, I'm, I guess I'm just a little bit too dumb, but could you explain the concept of the black tax again? Okay. I did not really understand what the, what the meaning of that is. I read the text, but I still didn't get it. What, what do they want? What, what is the concept, uh, what, what is the goal okay. of establishing a black tax in South Africa? Um, yeah, so the feminist movement in South Africa, I think happens alongside uh, what's happening globally but the, it was pushed a lot by white women at the time. And so um, what we can see within the, I would say the nationalist struggle is women who are then trying to make themselves not the tea girls 
as they, they were like supporting men in the movement. So they sort of put themselves as part of the movement. So that's why the ANC Women's League some, uh, emerges. It's part of that narrative of saying, we're not just here supporting, we're actually part of the movement. And, um, and then in the 70s and 80s, you see a lot of young activists who then go underground to join uh, the Umkonto Wesiza, which is the underground movement, or and other movements that were uh, happening at the time. And this were both men and women. So uh, a friend of mine just released a book, Sipokazi um, Magad, looking at um, young or oh, women who were participating in the um, underground movement. Uh, they were in Angola. Uh, they were in Zambia, they were in Tanzania, and many of them in that book talk about how they are aware, they are, you know, they are thinking around equality, feminism, but they also didn't want to be treated as women. They wanted to just be part of the team. And so, um, yeah, so it's this space where that whatever is happening globally has an impact, and this is why women's equality, I think, is at the forefront in our constitution. However, um, we say that they focused a lot on the legislator and not necessarily on the ground, like the minds of the oppressed. That, that narrative is, I think, something that uh, in the South African context, we were given rights with the hope that those rights will then translate on the ground, but uh, people themselves, whether that, whether shifts had happened, what had happened, that wasn't there. So I would say, that the feminist movement sort of plays a role in the South African context, but people find their own way in which they engage with it. Um, and then the Me Too movement happens uh, after the many of the hashtags in South Africa. So it's not, we don't, yeah, it's not, it, I mean, it's important because people are reacting to it, but it actually doesn't, yeah, the, <laughs> the students who are participating in this, are, they were more inspired by Black Lives Matter that happened before. So it wasn't, uh, yeah, Me Too is interesting, but they already do the speaking out. They know how to speak. It's more the what happens once we speak, what institutions are there uh, that are playing, that are making sure that they don't support us and that we want to uh, drop out. Uh, the last point about black tax. So black tax is something that has emerged uh, primarily because of, it's just the discourse that's coming up. It's a big debate in South Africa, but it's basically people, uh, black people complaining that the economic system says we, you know, to be successful, you sort of have to look after yourself. You have to it's be the mother, father, and two, three children, just the three of the family, the five people family. But in the South African context or the, in the Bantu context, it's the whole extended family that forms part of the story. And so for you to be a success, you have to look back, but the economic system says look forward. And so that's what they're trying to sort of highlight, that that the system doesn't actually encourage uh, this that we have to do. And so it, it becomes a burden. For others, it, they, um, yeah, for some people, there's a book that just came out and he, um, one author, he's a journalist, t tells a story about how he's, uh, he finished high school and was getting ready to go to university and then his parents told him that they don't have the money for it. And then um, the father left to go to the village in December, which is our Christmas period. And when he came back, he had money. And that money was from all his relatives. And he only found out later that his aunt, his uncle, his members of the people, members of the community within the larger village all contributed something. And so when he found out, he made sure to then uh, plow whatever means he had uh, when he was successful to help other young people in the village. And it's the same for me. So, but it's not always financial, and that's another element. So currently it's black tax and it's very financial based, but it's uh, helping young people in the village fill in application forms for university, uh, helping edit their CVs, helping connect them to a job. Yeah, which sometimes looks like it's corruption, but. <laughs> and Oh, sorry. I just wanted to say here, Frida, the black taxes, it's the hidden supplement that you pay for being black. <laughs> it's like it's like black VAT, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it, if you're standing shoulder to shoulder with a white counterpart, 
you have an extra 10%. <laughs> it's the or same. Or 20%. That's the black tax. And it comes from slavery, white supremacy, uh, white racism, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and in the case of a black woman, sexism and, and racism. Yeah. Kind of, I mean, I, I like your idea about labor and mm -hmm. you know tax and you know the, you know I guess you could also have working class tax. Yeah. Where people, it just depends on you know the context. basically people, yeah, mm -hmm. people who who kind of do and recognize mm -hmm. labor that you know. Um, but I want to take us back a little bit. I was I'm really interested in your um, in your. Uh, I, um, comment about how in many ways South African women have rights, mm -hmm. uh, but yet they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting irony, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm, I'm thinking of two things. Uh, do they not feel safe because they're more vocal about it? In other words, like I'm thinking of like a lot of rape happens probably in other parts of Africa and so on, but we don't have the kind of uh, um, uh, we, we, we platforms that yeah. you guys have in South Africa. Is it because there's more? I mean, and when you talk, hear about South Africa, it's always about rape, rape, mm -hmm. rape, rape. Is it because there's just more reported cases or more women and men, you know, that, you know, protesting rape, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or is there kind of an irony? And I'm thinking that this irony might go back to the, your first comment about how earlier on you had these women, you know, displaying themselves like in drum magazine, you know, mm -hmm. in the cover magazine of kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the, this is in the 70s. Yeah, in the 70s stuff, right? Uh, and you mentioned something about how these women were raped because they were seen as transgressive women, isn't it? Women who or the potential, to, potential, they deserve or to or be raped. they susceptible to rape. Yeah. Okay? There's also corrective rape where, where mm. lesbians are raped. Yes. Again, because there's this women are seen as kind of transgressing the normal, you know, kind of not. Mm -hmm. thing. So I'm wondering if the giving women power, then men begin to see them as uh, equally unruly, but in not, not necessarily in a sexual way, but kind of in a political way, mm -hmm. and therefore des you know, deserving rape. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, that, is, is it possible to kind of tr trace the thread of rape mm -hmm. as kind of uh, uh, men responding to the fact, fact that women have rights, or women can, are outspoken, women are out there showing their bodies and the, the, the passion women mm -hmm. practicing, you know, that, that men think, you know, this men, women are asking for rape, mm -hmm. or lesbians who women, you know, men think, okay, they are asking for rape because they are not doing the right kind of sex and mm -hmm. so on. So, I mean, is there a point then, and then, then go on to the, the to, to present to the... To the current the situation. Women are so actively involved that they are a threat to men's masculinity and therefore you know, mm -hmm. is, is, is this making sense? I, yes, I understand what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, that there's like a, a story. There might be a story there. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, how might we think about that? Can mm -hmm. we kind of stay in this moment of where women have power, supposedly have power with constitutional power, but yet they're being raped, you mm -hmm. know? It's, you know uh, so anyway, that's, that's, that's just we always. Yeah, in the South African context, everyone always says we, we, we talk too much, meaning that we tell our, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. Rape, crime, we're always on the news saying, yeah. uh, whether, uh, whereas in other contexts, the same problems happen and people are not as vocal. I, yes. Um, I think there is something to that, that um, thread right, in a way, yeah, yeah of, um, and I think when you think about it, for me, the danger of that kind of narrative, though, is that it assumes that, uh, where places where women are empowered or that they are equal to men or uh, in that they they should always be um, policed their behavior needs to be policed and I don't necessarily think yeah I don't know if that is a reality I think in the South African context that has been explained as a reason why 
women, like this narrative that you're highlighting has been explained as a possible reason to why women are feeling unsafe because now they've been given rights and they're equal to men and they can make choices and they don't need men, you know, those kinds of things. But I think there's more to it than, than that. And I think it's around uh, being able to gain power and believing that women are property. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that idea, but can you elaborate more? Because when you talked about sensing, you would then use like cause awards or yes. or, or, or uh, Zulu words or so on. And so for me, it seems more of a discourse thing rather than what, what exactly does sensing? Sensing, mean? okay, yeah. So it's relying on other senses. So, like, for instance, the example I give um, about like hearing my mom say, you know, um, if, you know, when you, uh, here, here's a good example. So uh, Yolandi posted a poster while doing her labor, uh, getting people to know her uh, problem or the issue that she was, she was faced with. And she talks about her grandmother being a domestic worker. And this is one of the reasons, uh, yeah, like that if university is so important for her. So expelling uh, Yolanda is something that, um, yeah, affects more than just her, right? Um, if we read that poster, it's, you know, yes, Yolanda is using that framing as kind of poverty porn, you know, like, look at me, my grandmother, we are struggling and all of that. But I also, I think if you sense that, in a way you allow yourself to hear what are other people saying when they see that poster about Yolanda's grandmother. Uh, the fact that... Sensing is using other senses. senses. It's not just, yeah, it's not just relying on this to see, it's using other senses. So hearing, touching, like what happens when we not only focus on what we see, so they're protesting. <laughs> they're not just protesting. We're not seeing their protests, but we, what songs are they singing? For instance, what are we hearing uh, they sing, right? Because there's also songs, you could be like, oh, they're singing a protest song, but the minute you hear it, you hear this is actually a song that has more to do with, like, death. You know, it's a song that we would sing at a funeral. And so what, that, what is the song telling me? And that is an African story that only shows up through the sensing of doing, using your other senses, hearing, touching, but not just relying on that one sense, which is to see. So what we see in front of us versus what we hear, what we touch, what are the other senses telling us? Okay. Yeah. Um, is arriving from the airport, <laughs> and she says, this was an exquisite Aww. presentation, and she asks, how is the nature of millennial and generational protest changing now that some are beginning to understand that their parents and grandparents were not silent during their suffering? Is it encouraging inter intergenerational organizing? In the beginning, when the protest started, the hashtags started, a lot of people thought that there was a disconnect, that the students thought, or especially the young activists, I keep calling them students, they are young activists, they thought that they were, um, they knew it all, you know, that, uh, that discourse, and it came from the older generation of uh, activists who some of them had been in the ANC, uh, all the different uh, organizations that had fought uh, against apartheid. Um, but I think over time, they've started to have conversations. And in 2019, the Total Shutdown March uh, was organized uh, between the young activists and uh, the older generation of activists. So I, actually they had a summit not long ago, a gender-based violence summit. It's a presidential one that came out of uh, the work that that kind of collaboration brought out in 2019. So they've been, and they've been doing the work together. So there is a lot of collaborative uh, moments. Even the Remember Kwezi uh, um, hashtag that started, they were talking to some of the one in nine uh, activists uh, to see if that's okay, um, how would they feel to get you know get an understanding of if that is okay because it's still uh, something that could be difficult for Kwezi. So there was there's a there is collaboration, but it's not uh, I would say uh, something that 
happened naturally. It was something that uh, I think like a conversation had to be had where people felt like, oh, uh, young activists are disregarding all the work we did and, and, and the kind of compromises we had to make because of the context in, w in which we're in. And so you're working within our foundation to do what you're able to do. So there is that acknowledgement, I think, now. Thank you so much for this fantastic talk. It, of Thank course, uh, Damaris would ask virtually <laughs> the exact question that I was gonna ask, so I'll, I'll try to put um, a little nuance to it. So one of, I, I think, the biggest uh, challenges that youth digital activists have is being told that they are self-centered and that they, they are thinking only of self. Mm -hmm. And in some of the stories that you showed, it, it was the case where people were reporting their own, and in others it was, this is what I learned from this hashtag, which mm -hmm. is an organizing tool, right, mm -hmm. to organize ideas and thoughts. But what you described around grandmothers in particular, I'm just really curious if you've seen any um, historical reference from the activists saying, this is what I've learned from these conversations, or even sensing in my family, you've talked about this mm -hmm. even at lunch, right? Where like, sometimes you feel or you know that there are things that are happening in your family that then emerge later. Mm -hmm. So the, the first question I have is, are we seeing beyond intergenerational activism, but within family, intergenerational stories that are emerging that young people are, are sharing of their, their family, so that's one. Mm -hmm. And the second is, um, you, you said something and it, it took root, so this idea of timing, so what November 1 is, this, this, the, the leaves falling off the trees, the, mm -hmm. the world healing and being able to, to reemerge in several months from now, and digital activism is all about the now and moving very quickly. I'm wondering if there's any sense that you've picked up around lessons that people have been gleaning around timing mm -hmm. in this activism space and, and what it means to potentially rest and wait until a certain time or to mm -hmm. work collectively around a certain time when it's most beneficial. Okay. Um, the first question, I think, if I'm like I'm now trying to remember it because now the second part is much more interesting. Um, but I'm gonna, let me go with the second question. Um, what is interesting and you'll find, I think there's a lot of data, uh, there's a lot of this in my data where young activists will talk about, so those who participated in the RU reference list, which happened in 2016, and then maybe two years later, they will remark on that and say it's two years ago at this point, we were doing this and that, and we are still here. <laughs> Nothing has changed. Or they will, you know, reference to something that has just happened that reminded them of that moment. Um, I just recently uh, looked at data from an activist who I know personally, who's uh, been documenting uh, sexual violence, or uh, not sexual violence, but the activism over the years. And she was um, thinking back, and she wrote, uh, like a piece and posted it on uh, uh, her Twitter page where she's just remembering and discussing what she learned, what she thought was happening at the time. And I thought that was really interesting that, you know, these are, when m many of these things, when the activism happens, for many of them, they're still university students. So Yolanda was like second year um, and third year when she's expelled from university and now she's a grown adult. And the funny thing about it is in time, in many times on Instagram, um, Twitter, you also see the older generation speaking and saying, give this child, uh, like they still treat uh, many of the activists as children as well because of obviously they're university students. So those who are speaking are, are also seeing them as younger and so therefore a child, but they're grown. And so it's also, I think the way in which they're also thinking and reflecting is having moved away from it and um, deciding also how to engage. We, many of them, I think we're responding to Yolanda's uh, win, historic win in March 2022. So it's the sort of like a year later, where are we, what have we done um, and what are we thinking about? So I feel like there is an awareness around time. They memorialize um, what they've been doing. Uh, sometimes just by, let's say there's a new hashtag that uh, is related to what they talked about, they will go back and bring that in and pin it to just 
keep people uh, remembering that this story is linked to that story. So there's, yeah. So I don't know though if there's um, much data or I've seen anything where people are talking about, I'm, you know, uh, logging out of Twitter. Like I'm giving myself time. Like I'm just, yeah, I'm not here for it. I haven't seen that, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised because this, I think they are also very much aware of, uh, of their mental health. Yeah, they're very much, they, I think one thing I learned doing this work is how conscious, how self-aware, how kind, loving, uh, but also angry these activists are. Um, and for me, the complexity of who they are and what they're trying to do and their awareness to be inclusive and to also highlight sometimes their mistakes is like it's very... Um, it has been a great learning experience. It's, uh, I, I, I sense that many times we dismiss, you know, activism, especially because it's young people, as just shallow, but there's a lot of thought put into it. They're very aware not to post someone's story if they have not gotten permission, or they're very aware to, the, you know, we need to use women X instead of just women. Uh, they're very aware of just little things that uh, sometimes I think we, as I would say for me specifically as an older uh, person to the activists, really just not thinking about, they pay attention and yeah, they are very intersectional in their approach. And I, it was it was such a great learning experience for me and I really found myself, um, yeah, honored to do the work that I was able to do and learn from them and how to even teach. So I think that's been, been a plus. The other point you meant, uh, I don't see much of that around family, but one was uh, a student talking about how her grandmother had warned her about when she had been accepted at Rhodes University to say, watch out, I've heard stories, which is interesting because I'm like, which grandmother, did you go to the university, you know, the generations, but maybe she had heard from someone else. But it was interesting to say, I was warned uh, about this, but I don't know of anyone who's come back and spoken. I haven't seen any, in, in, there's nothing like that in my data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kavaza. I, I am now looking at the whole digital material in a completely different way. So oh, I really, you. it was eye opening for me. And I also wanted to say, uh, I love, that is the perfect logo uh, for your <laughs> Thank <project>. the team. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I have a couple of comments and a couple of very naive questions, I think. Mm -hmm. but. I, when you were talking about uh, Remember Kuwaiti, I immediately thought of what happened in the U.S. with Anita Hill, whose mm -hmm. life was made miserable because she spoke out and yeah. was, became a pariah, and Monica Lewinsky as well. Yes. Uh, they, the, the victims were made the, uh, the enemy, and um, you know, uh, it, it's maybe a universal thing. <laughs> uh, the, the two naive questions I had, uh, this uh, speaking out about rape and other, uh, other um, mistreatment, is this both uh, black and white uh, South Africans? Are they working together on this? Mm -hmm. Or are they, is there still a divide? Mm -hmm. And um, also I was curious about, uh, you had spoken a bit about um, fluidity of jobs and things like that, but what about uh, lesbian or other LGBTQ people? Are they accepted? Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, or is that still not out in the open? Okay. Um, yeah, the story of Anita Hill and Monica Lewinsky, I think, yeah, that, you know, it's, it's much more common than we want to think. Um, I think what was interesting about Kwesi's case was that um, he was known to her as her uncle. He had been very good friends with her father. Um, and she actually speaks about this notion of, but he was my uncle. And a lot of people have, you know, sort of thought, oh, it's the extended family. But when someone says he's my uncle, they actually mean that, um, like for me, Malume means that, means very different things than just my father's brothers. So it's a two, those are completely different relations, social relations and expectations. So if I'm in the streets walking around and a guy approaches me and I immediately say to him, Malume, I'm trying to establish a, 
social relationship with you to say that you cannot ask me out on a date. This linguistically is something that we do. Yeah. So then it happens a lot. I'll say like, hi, Papa, which is like dad. And they, they get upset. Men, like, no, I'm not your father. Hey, you are at that age. So I don't, yeah, but it's a way of communicating that those relationships are a particular way and therefore those are the boundaries. And uh, so when she's saying that, she's also trying to assert that element that uh, he's my malume and him being malume to me means he's supposed to protect, he's supposed to guide. That is the expectation of a malume. Um, if she had like, mentioned brother, then they can date, but not uh, malume. So that element in itself, I think, um, was int it becomes interesting for me when I think about her case because of the kind of relationship that they had. Um, and then the race element, it's interesting, uh, the students who were uh, expelled, one of them actually is for, expelled for life, it, it's Yolanda and Dominic McFall, and she's white. And for me, I thought that was a performance by the university because they picked five students. So there were a lot of students who protested. I mean, I think I didn't post the picture, but it was a group of them half naked because they were doing the naked protest. And um, yeah, and then they picked five. And then they made sure that there was a black student and a white student, I think, for performance. And I think, but Dominic McFall actually uh, uses other routes to, uh, to engage her fight, whereas uh, Yolanda uses the more public route. So she actually has a press conference a few days or a day after the results come out that she'd been expelled and she shows her face to the public so we know who she is. Um, and I think that was very powerful because people started to relate. She built up a following um, and yeah, and she put in the labor and was able to get the kind of results she got. Um, whereas Dominique chose different routes and it's, it's also out of her choice and also what is accessible to her. She, maybe she can study overseas, whereas Yolanda can't. So those dynamics play into it. But the majority of people who are participating online it can be, it's really anyone. It's um, people who tell their stories are not, it's not race specific. It's the, the loudest voices are black, but we are the majority. So it's to be expected. But I think almost anyone speaks on race. They highlight different things. The black students talk about the, uh, like the institution, they talk about the racism, uh, that it's not kind to black women. Uh, they speak about that, but then uh, white students will also then speak about their own reality. So everyone speaks from their own perspective, I would say. And the last part, um, so I don't focus on um, the LGBTQ plus in this because it's also, I have a lot, but one of the um, interesting dynamics that I've noticed with the hashtags is that when it's, whenever it's LGBTQ plus or whenever it's a young woman from maybe a rural area and that hashtag goes viral, it always is justice for, which I think suggests that not everyone receives justice. And so um, people like Uyinene, who was a young student from UCT, her hashtag is, was I am next or I am Nene. You know, it's a particular kind of hashtag that we, we doesn't require justice because she is going to get justice. So there's this kind of awareness within the discourse and the, the activists themselves discuss this, that if you're young, pretty, you're more likely to go viral, especially if you're black and middle class, and which is the respectability politics that uh, we were talking about earlier, than versus if you're poor from the rural areas, um, yeah, or part of the LGBTQ+. But because the activists themselves are very intersectional in their work, they force certain um, hashtags to go viral, meaning that they, they, um, there are certain ha uh, activists who are very popular. And so if they retweet that particular hashtag, it will gain momentum. And so they use that power as well. But it's very, very difficult. Uh, there was a case where a friend of mine was trying to, uh, and we were trying to think about how to do this, where um, she, I, I, I don't know how she identified, but uh, she was involved in sex work. Um, and part of the LGBTQ plus community, but was also uh, part of the colored community in Cape Town. And she died in prison or in jail, in a jail cell. And so they were trying to get that vi uh, hashtag viral. And so it was, um, 
something that we were all trying to get to work. It didn't really work because there are certain bodies in South Africa that uh, demand our outrage and others we just ignore. And so it's, you know, it's the reality. But I try and deal with this in, other, in another chapter. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening and for sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Okay.